Okay, good morning everyone, at least it's, it's morning right now, and this is part two, and we were previously talking about uh, the, the various possible uh, positions that Bronte takes in Jane Eyre concerning Christianity, what's valuable in Christianity, what's worth retaining, and also what's um, worth exposing in terms of, of corruption or a, what I think amounts to a, a one-sidedness where we see Sinjin on the one hand um, being so overly spiritual and like Brocklehurst denying himself or he kind of lives what Brocklehurst wants the girls at Lowood to live which is this extreme denial of you know earthly passions, um, seeking only to do the work of God and putting that above everything else. Um, that seems to be a little extreme um, for Jane, even though she does admire his, his intellect and his willpower. I'm talking about Sinjin. Now, uh, Brocklehurst represents another, another side of the pole in which you, you use these doctrines as a way to uh, manipulate and bring down and abuse people. Um, so the question ongoing is, well, what is Bronte's position on these things? Um, and she uses uh, the setting as a way to sort of announce certain symbolic stances on this topic. For example, Thornfield. Um, this the name Thornfield. Of course, this is where Rochester lives. Um, you know, thorns in, imply like, you know, sharp, getting cut, um, you know, pain. Um, also, there's this idea that um, Thorn fields can be like walking through a thorny field could be like walking through life where there's a lot of temptation, where there's a lot of chance chances for doing something that is morally wrong. Um, and, and what we see with Rochester is somebody who at one point, he, he must have had, for the times, you know, extremely low moral standards, or at least that's the way that he looks at his past self. Um, he is a self-professed profligate, which means, you know, somebody who um, sort of lived a rough life due to having, you know, these, these lower standards. But is there still hope for Rochester? Well, um, at one point of the book, it seems like they reach a total impasse and that Jane is, is not going to be able to, um, live life with him on his terms and, and that that is a result of the choices Rochester made, which have sort of barred any chance of Jane and Rochester becoming connected. Um, and we do know that it, the marriage institution is important enough for Jane um, so that she can't just ignore Bertha Mason. Jane does become guilty of idolizing Rochester and I think that's also part of her big reaction to flee Thornfield um, because um, he be becomes this uh, almost too powerful too large a person in her life, um, and especially if she does agree to the terms of, of living with him, well, she's totally dependent on him, and she makes herself less than, and he becomes this sort of idolatrous obsession of hers. Um, so that's, you know, this is all argumentation that I have I've seen in, in literary criticism on this topic. Um, 
Jane realizes how much she has been idolizing and become almost almost blinded to the all of the red flags that are coming up you know with with um, Bertha Mason but first her brother um, Mr. Mason who shows up in his bit and she sees all of these things going on yet a part of her does not see them like she doesn't put it all together um, I think some careful um, more detective oriented readers are gonna know that yeah there's something fishy going on and anyway she wakes up to this and she she does pray and it is a supernatural intervention a vision if you will of of the moon not necessarily god in the biblical sense but the moon saying daughter flee temptation all right so let's compare the thornfield then to marsh and i am not quite certain about not quite certain how you can tie the name marsh end um but i because you know we know that so many names in jane Eyre mean things um well did jane get to the end of this sort of metaphorical marsh we know she was drenched in the rain and hypothermic and almost dying um so uh marsh end represents sort of the end of her wading through this quagmire of of moral um you know complex moral decisions concerning rochester and his situation which is is left unresolved um but back to what i was saying earlier that saint john and brocklehurst have a lot in common except for brocklehurst uses um his cold demeanor and his hardness his emphasis on doctrine and teaching he uses this to exploit others whereas sinjin uses it to help others and but in the the collateral damage is that he is denying himself um, a chance i think possibly for for happiness um, because he's so into this concept of of suffering in service of god but and he, you know to to consider even marrying somebody like rosamond oliver who who's very much infatuated and in love with him you know that's not even an option for him um he offers jane this possibility for this type of spiritual love where it's not that's not passion it's not attraction it's a chance to do good work together evangelical work together and he wants to take jane um, with him to india and the, the fact of the matter is that that jane Eyre, being small of stature and even sinjin that this is a huge risk the disease the um just the exposure to um the elements that one would undergo moving from england to, to india the long journey this is a very risky proposition health wise likely i think jane might not have survived it um that's my my opinion she almost goes along with sinjin almost um now it's interesting to note to this contrast that you know rochester in essence asks jane uh, before she runs away to to kind of give up god in place of him like to to leave behind your your moral principles and 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 try to use this loophole to maintain a partnership and live together happily ever after similarly um ja sinjin asks jane to make a different type of sacrifice they're both sacrifices and they're both things that compromise um jane's completeness or complete individuality they are both things that would um deny the union of 
her name, Jane Eyre, and the two sides that we explored of her name, um, and what those mean, and how those come together and unify her character um, by going with Rochester in part in the earlier part of the novel, or going with St. John in this section of the novel, Jane is going to be denying um, a good portion of herself. So what do we do? We're at an impasse again. Um, but like many impasses and potentially dead ends um, in the novel, this is the supernatural that comes in and brings things around to an unexpected conclusion. Okay, I'm getting my bearings again. Critical opinions, there's a couple of varying ideas that one of them is that, you know, Christianity, something that Jane has to overcome, a, hurt, a patriarchal hurdle, misspelling there, my apologies. And, and once she does kind of get over the patriarchal grip that, that this sort of old religion has on her, um, then she will find her true identity and you know, have this happy reconciliation at the end. Um, other critics have suggested that um, Jane Eyre puts forth this idea that there can be both a masculine and feminine God and that the feminine side of God has um, oh, that's my battery about to go out. Mm, shoot. Okay, back. That um, what she brings to the table in terms of allowing for a feminine divinity um, is is this acceptance of of earthly love and sexuality and, and partnership. Um, Sinjin does, doesn't allow for that, um, but there's something in the partnership between Jane Eyre and Rochester that does seem to incorporate this balance between the masculine and feminine and putting them on equal terms. So that the type of religious person that Jane is at the end of the novel is one that sort of um, transcends this overly masculine and overly patriarchal Christianity. Um, some say that God, the male voice of God, is represented by Rochester, Rochester's call. Um, and then others say that, and, and the same people will also say that, you know, that that stands in contrast to the song that Bessie sings um, about this divine presence as a, as a loving mother. If you go back into, I think it's chapter two, there's a, there's a great little song that Bessie would sing to, to Jane. Um, the significance of the names also kind of reinforced this idea of, of an exploration of like this, the pagan and the Christian and how those two might actually be unified. Um, Jane fully succeeds when she is on equal terms with Rochester and and then she's not deifying him. Um, and then the possible message and conclusion could be that when Jane finally achieves marriage with Rochester and has a child and and she's helping him and and, and, and helps him, regain his strength and even his vision, um, that maybe she does concede that domestic life can be a viable al avenue for service, that she doesn't have to go to India to be spiritually fulfilled. Um, and I think it's very clear to see that there is an, a, one of the big achievements of Jane is this balance between passion and reason and the balance between the masculine and feminine sides of God. Um, various times in her life, she's swung on, on one side or the other, and he, in the end, it becomes unified. <laughs>